Hello, my name is Chris Lemaire and I'm a programmer at the American Cinematheque. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual Q&A with filmmaker Thomas Vinterberg and actor Mas Mikkelsen, uh, who are both joining to discuss their wonderful new film, Another Round. Uh, the conversation is moderated by Katie Walsh, who is a film critic for the Tribune News Service and the LA Times. So we're super happy that she could join us and we hope you enjoy the following conversation. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Hello. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thomas Vinterberg, the writer, director, and the amazing star, Mods Mickelson. Thank you guys for being here to talk about this film, which is such a delight and so illuminating and fascinating in so many ways. Um, I, I just enjoyed it so, so much. And I know everyone here probably enjoyed it so much too. And we have a lot of questions and I have a lot of questions. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, but first I have to ask just like Thomas, where did this idea come from? How did you find this theory that human beings are born with a deficit of alcohol? Well, <clears throat> first I looked at world history and I saw how many great and fantastic things that have been accomplished by people who are very drunk. Um, <laughs> General, generals, politicians, artists, writers, all over the world at all times. Um, <clears throat> then someone sent me this theory, which ac academically speaking does not sum up to real theory, which is just some, something uh, a psychiatrist said and wrote in a book. And uh, we called him and we discussed this and we decided to base the film upon this theory. Which, which is just something I call it. Right, of course. Uh, it's not totally a scientifically proven theory, but it's a theory that a guy had one time. But I love that you mentioned yeah. world history. I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, it, when the founding fathers were writing the constitution, apparently they were all drinking a ton of cider at the time all day long. So it's true that, you know, Churchill and Hemingway and all of these amazing people who created amazing art or did amazing things, were kind of sauced when they did it. Well, think about this, you know, Churchill decides to send a couple of hundred thousand civilians into war in fisher boats. And if history speaks right, he, he might not have been sober when making this decision. And the question is, would he have made this decision if he was? You know, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of things to be thought about there. So Mods, when, Thomas brought this script to you, this idea to you, or, or, or floated the idea to you. What, what was your initial reaction to hearing what another round was about? I was just waiting for an excuse to be drinking 40 days in a row. Uh, I, no, I was, um, he pitched this story for me a long time ago, uh, I believe in 2013 or something. At that point, they were not high school teachers. My, my character was working as a, uh, you know, uh, at the control tower in an airport, which obviously oh. laid ground for a lot of funny, uh, funny incidents. Um, so everything he pitched was funny and interesting. Uh, and the theory itself, I think it, it, of course, it's true. We all know what that is, two glasses of wine. We know that the conversation is lifting. We know that we become more brave. We forget some of our troubles. Uh, we might even be able to pick up that phone and make that important phone call. We don't, uh, we don't dare doing. Uh, so, so we know it's, there's something true in there. Two glasses is very different than two bottles, of course, and, and that's the topic of the film. Um, I love that it was almost an air traffic controller. I feel like it could have been a little bit more of a suspense thriller or an action <laughs> film at that yeah. point. You know, I mean. Being in charge of high school students while a little bit tipsy is, um, you know, has its own, you know, high stakes uh, mm -hmm. issues in, in it. But, you know, I definitely think had some teachers with some uh, just alcohol on their breath. So, you know, we've all been there. <laughs> or maybe, but, we all remember those. Um, but I think that's another one of the things that makes this film, which is like rather a, you know, sort of offbeat idea, but what it ties into are these really universal themes of feeling lost or um, just a sense of ennui in your life, not really feeling passionate or energized. And I think that, you know, everyone can kind of relate to that and, and understand those themes really, really well. And um, 
I'm wondering, Mads, like your uh, performance is conveying this person who exists in these two uh, polarities. You know, he's very reserved and, and kind of dealing with a lot of inner turmoil, but then he's also, you know, euphoric and kind of uh, finding this release uh, through alcohol. So what was your approach to this character and this performance? I mean, was it something that you related to or did you have to kind of like really dive into Martin and his, his issues? I, I don't relate to the, uh, the standstill in his life. I, I, I am my nature a very curious person. I, I do enjoy the fact that the sun rises every morning and, and it makes me curious what's behind that house. And Martin is obviously he's, he's standing on the platform and the train has left him. He's not curious anymore. So my approach was, I think that we both agreed on that, you know, the, the first couple of times that he starts teaching uh, under the influence, where, what is not insane, but he's kind of liberated. That was the old Martin. That was the Martin he was 25 years ago. So he's finding himself through, through those, those theories. And then of course he takes it a little further and, and other things are happening. Um, what I did relate to in the film was, was the idea of, you know, it's, it's a life embracing film. It's obviously the, uh, the, 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 the energy or the, the, the thing that is consuming the film is the alcohol, but, but within that, there is obviously a film about embracing life. And this is a man who is partly disappointed on his past and quite a bit jealous on the future when he's seeing all these kids around him and he's forgotten how to embrace the presence. And uh, so that is, that is his journey in the film. Well, it definitely comes through, especially at the end. Um, I, I know I really want to talk about the end of the film because I think it's such a special um, ending. And it it's a complicated film because it really deals with sort of the agony and the ecstasy that all of these four friends go through and the dark side of things doesn't shy away from that. Um, but the ending is just, it is about unlocking joie de vivre without you know, just through yourself. And the dancing is incredible. So mods, are you, are you a dancer? Do you have a dance background? I mean, you have to have to have been a dancer. Yeah, yeah, I used to be a dancer. I was a dancer, a professional dancer for not a long career, but nine years, I believe. That's uh, a long time. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I started late, like I do with everything in life. Um, so I did that for nine years and that turned into acting later on. So yes, it was already written in, in the story. Thomas had this idea uh, and it was obvious that we would make March not a professional dancer, but at least he, he'd done it as a hobby, what we call jazz ballet back home. Uh, so that was a theme. So there was a discussion where it should be placed. It was at one point, it was in the middle of the film and then it ended up rightly so at the end of the film. But the bigger discussion was how to pull it off uh, I was very reluctant. Uh, um, I had an idea that could come across quite potential, uh, potentious, and, and and maybe I I wanted to be a little more like a, a magical dream, a drunken man's fantasy, taken out of reality. And Thomas was always very nice and listening to me and nodding and listening, but he said, "No, you're just dancing, man, for real." <laughs> and um, I gave in, and he was absolutely right. But there was a bit of a struggle. Am I right, Thomas? You're right. You can actually see it in the scene a little bit, reflected in the choreography. He's dancing a little bit, then he's it's pulling away, and then he's dancing a little bit more, and then he's pulling away again. And then finally he gives in and devotes himself and flies. And uh, that was a, pretty much how the process went down. So Thomas, were you always like looking for an opportunity to, to showcase his dancing skills on, on screen? Not just that necessarily in this movie, but any film. You're like, I'm gonna get it in there some way. I always felt that having this amazing actor and knowing that he can also dance was like an opportunity that had to be uh, used and challenged at some point. Um, but this is how I approach actors. I, I wanna, you know, unfold all the nice little gifts that they, they, they have embedded in them. And, uh, but this one was a big one. It, it was, yeah, it was a dream for me for a while. And, uh, it, and you know, the idea of a teacher suddenly ending up in a dance like this was obviously a bit of a stretch and had to be prepared well in the film. 
and was something that Tobias Lindholm, the right co-writer and myself was discussing over and over again. Is this real? How can this become real? Uh, and there was a lot of work behind that, but I, but that only proves how much I wanted it. I wanted him to dance at the end of the story. Well, I also love the ambiguity of the ending, um, especially for a film like this that that deals with something that you know it's everyday life. Like everybody, you know, either drinks or deals with drinking in some way in their lives, and it's part of our culture. But um, it's not prescriptive about you should do this or you should do that. And I appreciate that about the film very much, even though it explores all aspects of drinking. Um, but I think that the ambiguity at the end, especially, we don't even know where he lands. I mean, Mods, where did you land when you took that flying leap, like in the in the drink, to, so to speak? I landed in a very, very cold water. Uh, and I was so proud of that shot. It was quite a high leap, actually. And we shot yeah. it a couple of times. We had an underwater camera. So it did not end up in the film. Um, and that was just a fraction of me that was a little annoyed with that. But the... No, no, he has to, it has to end there. This is a, the question is obviously, is the man flying or is the man falling? And that's yeah. exactly where we wanted to end the film. Uh, and people can interpret that the way they want. You ask me and you ask Thomas, he's flying. Yeah. You know, here in, uh, in, in Denmark, where the film has been a massive box office success, you have youngsters sitting with a bag of beer watching the film for the fourth time wow. uh, on the way out to town. But next to them, you have anonymous alcoholics who finds that the movie's about them. Right. Uh, and we always, uh, we, both Matt, me and, and uh, the writer, Tobias, always wanted the film to be open. It's an exploring film. Uh, we wanted to steer away from any sense of morality uh, or too much provocation. We wanted this to be a survey of, of, of alcohol and of life. You know, the, world, the, the word spirit is embedded in the, the word inspiration. And we had the ambition of making a film about more than just alcohol, but about the art of living and the art of living successfully. Um, and to me, the end, it was, it was important. It became a beautiful catastrophe and, it, and that it ended in ecstasy. Uh, we had a we have we have a guy who, who didn't make it, and then we have Matt who should be flying, and then dropping into the water and everything became cold and real cold and real again it was a bit of a disappointment. So we uh, we we kept him flying. Maybe that can be a deleted scene on the Blu-ray when it comes out. The underwater footage. <laughs> right. Does anyone see that kind of stuff anymore? I don't know, but uh, yeah, it could be. I'm happy to show. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think, I think, I, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd look for it. Um, I also absolutely adore the scene where the four friends get very drunk on Sazerac's and then they attempt to procure some fresh codfish to um, comedic ends. Um, my first question is, how did you decide on a Sazerac? Because I thought that was like a very specific choice that was really interesting because you know, it's a regional cocktail, very known in New Orleans. So I was just curious if you had like a special connection to that drink. Yeah, I mean, of course I've had a few, but <laughs> what was great about the Sazerac is it, it's made to look like a cocktail, but it's pure alcohol. Right. It's basically getting you very drunk very fast. And that was what this chapter was about, getting above the, you know, above the limits of alcohol intake. Um, so maintaining a sense of elegancy and yet still just get very quickly, very drunk was, was sort of embedded in that particular drink and, uh, which comes with many recipes and, and a lot of people have a lot of love towards that drink. And it has put many people in very interesting situation, I think, situation. <laughs> like trying to go fishing for, for codfish in the middle of the exactly. day. Exactly. Um, but that's such an interesting scene because it's kind of the most broadly comedic scene in the film. And it kind of ties into this idea that I wanted to ask you about the tone of the film. Um, in terms of like having elements that are comedic, but then also having tragic elements and balancing that pathos. And it feels so real to life because life is sad and life is funny and life is weird. And you find yourself in absurd situations. And 
you create that so authentically. So is that just like finding the right group of actors who you know and who know each other or how is that is that on the page? I mean, how do you achieve that sense of tonal balance? Well, I was just about to ask what tone? I mean, this film is so <laughs> right. full of different tones and notes and directions. Right. And it's very interesting because as, as a filmmaker, my instinct is of course to tame the beast and create a stringent vision. And, uh, but every time we tamed it, either it was in the script or in the editing, we sort of killed it a little bit. The structure of this film had to be drunk with them. And, and you know, we, at some point the codfish scene was cut out because it, no, was, just, no, no. it was just not as tasteful as the rest of the movie. Right. We killed it and we needed it back in. Um, the sense well, it of- was a tricky scene though. I mean, it was a tricky scene in, in many ways because as you said, it was maybe the most comedian scene and, and there was a part of us that we were aware of that. And, and I think that Thomas also wanted it to go that direction. But for the DOP, the cameraman, it was just, uh, it was a nightmare because he had four, four kids that was going in each their own direction. So he couldn't really capture us at the same time. Even though we were not drinking, we kind of got in, intoxicated by the situation. It was smitten by, between each other. And, and there was people inside the boat, somebody was in the water, somebody was up in the mast. And at the end of the day, it was just too much. So you really had to control some of that though. Right. But you're talking about a sense of realism or truthfulness in, in the movie, which obviously comes down to uh, asking the four best actors in my country to, to be part of this movie, because I, I really did challenge them. They had to be funny, they had to dance, they had to be drunk, and they had to protect a, a super refined emotional journey as well. Uh, so they were tested to the limits and uh, and um, not everyone could have done that. Uh, you really are asking them to play so many different notes in wow. this emotional range. It's not just one, you know, range all the way through. It's like all over the place. You know, it's tragedy, it's comedy, and that's so impressive to be able to do all of that. I agree with that, <laughs> and uh, I have. They have my deepest respect. Not the least, the guy here next to us, Mr. Miggleson. But also so, another thing is that we, we, wrote, we wrote the script for these four names. And of course, <clears throat> that gives you a head start in the process of trying to make things as, as truthful as, as possible. Uh, and authentic on. because you sort of know what their characters are or what they can authentically play um, or sort of attune the character to each actor. Right. And then, it, then at the end, there's the editor who cuts away the stuff where, you know, the drunk stuff that was a bit too much or, you know, like the codfish scene. It was a balance, really. When it was a little bit longer, it was just another film. It was, and it was just way too much. And it really, it, it really was a balance. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it took a lot of work from a lot of people, but primarily a lot of great work from four fantastic actors. So Mods, what is the key to authentically acting drunk on screen? I think the, uh, the way most actors will approach it, which we also did, is that what come, it comes in different stages, right? So, so when you, if you're talking about two or three drinks, that's, you, you try to hide it. It's a little like in our personal and private life. You don't want your night neighbor to see it, so you hide it. You, you, you move a a bit slower, you're a little more precise in your movements, and then obviously that gives you away. Uh, so that would be the approach that we always go to as actors, you know. But we, of course, had to go all in, into the Charlie Chaplin level, where, where you don't care anymore. You don't care if people see it. You, you really, you, you're in a different world. Uh, and for that, I think we, we can remember some of it. Uh, it's not always you can remember you've been that drunk, so, so that's not really useful. But then you go uh, you go on YouTube and you watch some Russians go completely ballistic, you know, and, and, and there is tons of material in there. And it's so insane and it's so over the hill that as actors, we kind of feel, if they can get away with that, so can we. But there are certain tricks, obviously. It's not just strange, strange movements. It's, it's uh, they're always very focused on the task that's right ahead of them. 
uh, and that task is never fulfilled, of course. Uh, and they fall, and when they fall, they do not use their hands at all. They just use their faces. So, so we had to come up with a, some, some hidden mattresses uh, once in a while to, to, to go for it. Were there any mishaps on set? Like you mentioned the codfish scene with the DP unable to kind of get you all in frame together. I mean, are there any stories from the set or from the shoot that were, you know, things got out of a, hand? No, not, not out of hand, but, but I think that was one of the main things that once you, do, you, you, you get that uh, wild card to go for it and, and you trust each other. We have four actors and a director, we trust each other. Uh, and it, it becomes intoxicating to be in that situation. And, and, and there'll be a lot of times where you, you're doing a scene and you think that was, we nailed it, but we realized that what the cameraman wasn't even there because we were hiding in the bottom of the boat, you know, <laughs> because you forget everything about him. So that was like, we had to, you know, wheel back once in a while and said, we have to put a little structure on some of this because we're just behaving like little kids now, right? <laughs> but I mean, once, once you're in there and it feels real and it's attached, as you talked about before, uh, to something uh, authentic, uh, then that's the joke or that's the fun we want to come across with. We don't want to make jokes for the sake of a joke. We want it to be hooked up on something authentic, of course. But uh, well, when you start playing and behaving like little kids, uh, then that's where you need some structure. Thomas, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about the film was the way that they approach the theory and they're writing a scientific paper and they're doing experiments. And I almost felt like, I mean, I loved that structure of it where, where they're, they're upping the ante every you know couple of weeks or whatever. But I also felt like it kind of almost felt like a satire of this life hack sort of culture that we've gotten into, you know, oh, if you do fasting, you'll unlock some, you know, high performance. If you do meditation, if you do whatever, if you do paleo diet, like it's, I feel like we've all be, we're all searching for this answer, this, you know, magic bullet to like cure us of our, of our ills and, and whether it's fasting or meditation or, or drinking, you know, having constantly being buzzed on two glasses of wine. I mean, it almost felt to me a little bit like that. Were you thinking about that at all or? Well, yeah, to some extent, it was a, a reaction against that, a satire on that, and, and a satire of this very chest and confined life that we're living. Uh, you know, um, it's a film about letting yourself become uncontrollable. It's a film about losing control and winning something by losing control. And so if anything, this, this film was a fight for the uncontrollable. Our lives are so measured down to how many steps we take. Our cell phones are measuring that. And my daughters have to lay out plans for their education at a very early stage. And um, when, when you write an article for a newspaper, on your screen, there'll be the number of clicks your article gets, right? So even you journalists uh, has to think about clickbaits and, and everything is about that. And, and in this world, we forget about the uncontrollable a little bit. The uncontrollable can be a beautiful thing. It can be such as falling in love. That's beyond your control. It says that you fall and then suddenly you meet something grand. Um, uh, which get, when you get an idea, when you get inspired, it's also beyond your control. It, it's just something that comes to you. Now, putting a bottle to your lips is sort of a um, contract with the uncontrollable. You, you go into a room of, of something that you don't know where it's gonna end. And either I'm gonna get beaten up or I'm gonna end, end in bed with someone or a third thing, but at least it's beyond my control. Um, and we enjoyed that. Maybe because our lives are pretty controlled. <laughs> well, it's so, I mean, I love that idea and especially the way, the way it ties into the ending of, of him releasing all control, you know, falling into the water and everything. But um, the, the initial approach is to control it, right? To say, we're gonna have this much, we're gonna write it down, we're gonna do, you know, we're gonna do it like a proper scientific experiment. And so sort of over the course of that, they realize that they can't control what they're doing. Oh. 
with all good experiments and with all great art, actually, it's framed, it's set up. Even when you, even in your childhood, when you, when you played games and you had to shoot each other, when you got shot, you had to count to 10. And if you mm-hmm. only count to seven and then got up, the, the, the game was destroyed. Uh, so of course you have to make your set of rules and make it sharp uh, right. and, and, and stringent. And then within those uh, frames, they can go bazongas. Yeah. It's, it's but it's not that it's getting out of control. I mean, they, I think they're fairly focused in the sense that if, if two drinks is good, why wouldn't four drinks be twice as good? You know, right. that's the logic. Uh, as long as they that's feel the they're in, uh, in control, uh, that's the logic, obviously. And then at a certain point, they lose that logic. But, but, um, but I, think that, I think that's quite a normal, that's a normal approach. Two is good, four is twice as good, right? I've definitely had a night like that. (laughs) But it's an interesting thing because we were talking about curiosity. We're talking about putting your own life at risk. We're talking about being open and explorative in your life, being inspired, basically. And people are asking me, can this happen without alcohol? And I'm saying, of course. We had that on our film. Uh, The guy playing Tommy, he's an anonymous alcoholic. And he's leading a very living a super inspired and open and creative life. Of course you can, but a lot of people forget to do so. Mm-hmm. A lot of people in, in a you know everyday life which 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 bores them to death. Well, I'm gonna take some questions from the audience. We got some good questions coming. So um, the first one says. Music seems to play an important part in Martin's story. His reaction to the singers in the restaurant, Tchaikovsky, the children singing outside the church. Can you tell us more about the role of music in the film? Right. Um, To make this film as real as possible, uh, I decided not to go with the traditional score, uh, commenting creating an atmosphere. I wanted Mats and his friends to create the atmosphere. And then I sort of made a rule for myself saying, but they can hear music that exists in this universe and they can, and we can play it a couple of times even, even as a score, but, um, and that way the songs became, became very important. Also, this is a portrait of our country. It's in many ways, it's a celebration of our country and the beautiful songs of our country. Um, Also, I think music is so related to the ecstasy of getting drunk. And when it comes to the end scene, that particular song has become inseparable from the movie, I think. Uh, We chased some very expensive rides all over the world for a long time. And my wife just kept saying, there's a Danish band, they have the song you need. And she just kept playing it for me. And finally I gave into it. And now I, I'm, I'm deeply in love with that song. Even the, the, the song, what is that? I can't remember the name of that great soul music what? song in the, in the Sazerac scene, but that's just like, it evokes it's such called, a mood. It's called Sissy Strut. Yes, yes. I knew it was Sissy something, but I couldn't remember Strut. the second word. <laughs> the meters. Yes, yes. That took, long, that took a long time to find because it had to be cool. It could not be too hectic, vibrant, young, because that's, that would make them look old. Mm-hmm. And yet still it had to be a celebratory, upbeat moment. You know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, things going on. I think we listened to a thousand songs before this sort of uh, came into place. And then a lot of music, musicians also did not want to appear in a, music, in a film about drinking. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, that was a bit of a struggle. <laughs> um, so this is a question. So uh, this is for question, a uh, question for Thomas and then one for Mods. It's, were there any scenes that you struggled to write, Thomas? And then for Mods, were there any scenes that you struggled in performing or that you had a hard time with in performing? Well, I struggled a little bit with the long scene in the restaurant in the, the beginning the- where Mads ends in tears. Uh, because I wanted it to be long and I wanted it to sort of be a film in the film. And because we, our main character was already crying in the 19th minute of the movie, which is unusual. 
So it really had to build up in the right way. And that, that little symphony in itself was something that demanded a lot of work in the writing and in the editing. Uh, maybe the one that took most work. And then Mods, did you have a, a scene that was challenging to film or perform? I have to watch what I'm saying now. <laughs> it, was, it, might, it might look challenging, no, but I think that like the other film I did with Thomas called The Hunt, it, it, it might look difficult, but when it's that well-written, you kind of lean into it and it makes it much easier. The, the most difficult scenes that, that for an actor are the scenes that's not working. You know, the scenes that just you can't you can't figure out how to solve this because it's it's not written the way it's supposed to. And we didn't have any of those scenes, they were all well written. We were struggling as a, an entire cast, I guess, with, with some scenes, uh, especially the, the funeral scene, uh, the church scene, but that was for, for other reasons than than material. That was for private reasons. Um, I love uh, that the funeral scene reminds me of the amazing child who, Specs. I loved him so much. What a great addition. And he, <laughs> he was broke actually, my heart. You know, this is, uh, believe it or not, he was, um, he was a little annoyed with, with being cast for that specific part because he was like the kid who wasn't that good at soccer. He was the absolute the best of the kids playing soccer. He, would, he was a tiny little messy. He was a genius with a ball. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we held him back a little, uh, uh, but um, in the little breaks he had, he showed us how good he was. Yeah, he was a, he was a, he's a, like, he, yeah. he's like, I got to prove that I'm actually good at soccer. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, a couple more questions um, for Thomas. Can you please talk a little bit about the choices you made with the camera movement changes as the characters spiral deeper into drinking throughout the film? Right. Um, Stuola, Sturla, I think you would call them in America. Stuola is, is, the, is the name of the DOP. And I had meetings about this. And we agreed to portray reality in its edgy, not musical, not smooth kind of way, you know, with uh, rigid movements. Uh, loud sounds that suddenly appears and interrupt what you're about to say. Um, the awkwardness of reality. And then when they started drinking, we wanted it to smoothen up and become a pleasure. Uh, like a 747 taking off into the sunset. Uh, so that we sort of enjoyed the alcohol and felt the alcohol in their blood, in their veins. And then of course, when it becomes trashy and horrible later, it becomes muddy again in the camera work. Uh, but he's, he's the kind of cameraman he's, who's super sensitive to what's happening. So the scenes and the actors and the atmosphere of the scene pretty much dictated what the camera did. And were you primarily working handheld, steady cam? Solely handheld. Okay. Everything in this movie is handheld. Mm -hmm. uh, because he's, he's fantastic at doing that. And because I wanted that truthfulness that comes with, with the handheld camera. And he, he's the operator as well, the camera operator? Right. Okay. Which is normal um, in a humble shire. <laughs> well, you never know if the DP standing to the side, <laughs> giving directions, or, you know, I guess they all have different styles. Katie, our film crews are just smaller. So we have right. to deal with more things. <laughs> well, there was a question actually relating to that um, for mods, which is that the, you know, just talking about the difference between making films in Denmark and making, you know, US blockbusters, you know, is there a preference for one or the other? Or, you know, how do you feel about the two different styles of, of production? Well, um, I feel good <laughs> about both of them. <laughs> I, I grew up with what we're doing here in another round. This is, this is our approach to, to making films. So of course I feel at home in a different way than I do when I go to a big set and they have a spider camera <clears throat> and the shot is you know, controlled uh, uh, by a computer. Uh, but that's, that's also interesting to find the truth in that moment. You know, it, it, there is something with the handheld, of course, it's, it, it's as if it's our shadow, it's always there, it's, it's there, it will capture what needs to be captured. 
<clears throat> it's a different way of working together when you're having um, cranes and spider cameras. And we always try to make it a small set, a small situation, a truthful little situation and trying to forget the surroundings. That is obviously much easier when, when, uh, when it's going on on a level that we do in Denmark, but it's part of our job. I don't, <clears throat> I don't want to choose between the two. I love both. Well, it's almost like you have to have the balance. Like you, you know, you go try something different and then you you go home and ground yourself yeah. with your longtime collaborators and friends. Exactly. Um, and Both things are inspiring to the other. So, so it's, it's, it, they go hand in hand. Should be. Right. Um, for Thomas, the question is, why did you use that particular quote from Kierkegaard at the beginning of the film? Um, the, the quote in the beginning uh, is a quote about youth and about getting older. Uh, there's an endless amount of ways to analyze that quote, which I think is part of the beauty of it. But it does remind me um, of the weightlessness of being young, what these four characters are yearning for and what I occasionally is yearning for and am yearning for. You know, I remember being 16 and a little bit drunk, four o'clock in the morning in, in my flowered garden, slightly in love and feeling that I was flying, feeling the weightlessness. And I think the words from Kierkegaard reflects on that in the most precise and beautiful way. But he's quoted a couple of times throughout the movie. Um, and he's probably the man ever who's been reflecting on lack of control in the most elaborate way. What, the, the, you know, the gifts you can get, the gifts that you can get from letting go of control. That's, that's a wonderful answer to that question. Um, let's look at more audience questions. Um, are you planning to collaborate together again anytime soon? Yes. Two of you. Anything in the works or nothing that you can talk about yet? No, I don't know. But uh, but my plan is uh, one day you just have to pick up the phone and I'm ready. Ah, that's beautiful. Uh, you know, there's there there's no such thing I would rather do than to work with Matt. And um, it's been such a joy ride both times, and I think we've come very far both times. And and um, the abilities and the strength Matt has as a friend and as an actor would make me want to go back to that. But it requires the perfect thing. I would never do a half step towards him. It would have to be a full on approach. You have to have the fully formed idea and then, you know, sort of present him with that. It has to be the right thing. Yeah, know? the right Nobody thing. Can, yeah. He can he can play everything, but you know what I mean? It, it has to be worth it. Just my two cents. Um, I think a musical with dancing should be the next project. Well, uh, <laughs> you ready for that, Matt? <laughs> well, now I'm getting reluctant again. Let me think about it. <laughs> you know, totally grounded, authentic, handheld. We just want to see more yeah. dancing. <laughs> you, yeah, you have to understand, nobody, and I mean nobody wants to pay to listen to me sing. <laughs> for a good reason. Okay. We'll, we'll work around up. that. We'll work around that. There's ways of getting around that. <laughs> I have to say about the dancing scene in this film, maybe this people love that scene so much because it's earned. You know, it's been through 20 minutes of severe darkness right before. And there's a, an, an element of disappointment about this, this concept that didn't work, ended up not working for them. And then finally, there, there's, you know, if he'd been dancing throughout the movie, it would have been a bit. <laughs> it's true. It come, it's very surprising in, in many ways, but also I totally agree with you that like any sort of you know cinematic catharsis, whether it's like violence or emotion or you know, right. euphoric dancing, like it does need to be earned and like have the the audience invested in, in that happening. So you're you're totally right that it's like the euphoria that we kind of need, that release. It's like you create that for, um, for but the a audience. But a non-singing musical. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure something out. You know, a dance film or something. Um, uh, just send me the script, I'll look at it. 
<laughs> um, so another question, have you noticed the drinking culture of various countries having an effect on how the film was received there? Or was it more surprising to learn how universal drinking culture can be? And this, I know you said that like this film has been a huge success in Denmark and I'm just curious, like, has it caused any conversations or about drinking or, or it, it, it seems like it, it inspires honesty about, about drinking in a way. It's, it seems like so far every country it has met, uh, people have a very rare, a very strong relation to and history with alcohol. But also it seems that people understand that the movie is about more than alcohol and uh, that it's uh, about universal themes, such as being in your midlife, being inspired and uninspired and, and so forth. Um, it, it surprised me a little bit that in, in a world of confinement, death, uh, and you know, the world of Corona, basically, uh, bankruptcies and stuff, that the film, landed as such a, you know, revelation for people. I was afraid it would land slightly irrelevant. Mm. Uh, and it seems that the opposite has happened. They need to see people embrace and dance and drink and sweat all in the same room. Uh, it's um, apparently something people are missing. Yeah, I think that's, you know, everyone is is craving that connection, being in a bar, having drinks with friends. Um, my friend, Bill Ross, who's a, a documentary filmmaker who uh, made a, a film about a bar, he was saying, oh my God, I can't wait to be drinking Sazeracs and listening to Sissy Strutt with my friends again. And I think that we're all kind of relating to that sense of connection that you can find having drinks with friends or, or you know, dancing with a bunch of high school teenagers on a pier, you know, like, or, or, you know, at a bar, whatever it is. And it's like that we're getting a little piece of that in this film, but yes, it is about so much more than just alcohol. It becomes this really philosophical journey into like unlocking the part of yourself that can feel uncontrollable or can, can be receptive and open to, to joy and to everything that life has to offer. Um, the highs and the lows. But I think that's I think the reason. I think I, I've often said that Thomas has made his most Italian film. And, and what I mean with that is not that it's an Italian, Italian topic. I mean that it doesn't matter how dark or sad or brutal an Italian film is, you always leave the movie theater with a sense of loving life. Uh, and I think that that's what this film does. This film is a, is a life embracing film. And, and as Thomas said, young people, old people, middle-aged people leave the theater with a feeling of, of wanting to embrace life. Of wanting and, to run around a lake with a box yeah. of beer and, and vomit. <laughs> <laughs> Why is, that is like universal across cultures. Like I know guys who would do running and be, chugging beer races. And I'm like, this really must be like some ancient primal ritual <laughs> well it's just uh, cheaper. you get you know you get your pulse up you get drunk much faster it's just cheaper. <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know how much time we have left but uh one of the sort of kickstarts for this movie was that i had a visitor from from hollywood uh she was writing a film with me it, it took off with uh, you know it didn't happen but she stayed with me for a week she was very very intelligent very, and she's an american uh, and she meets my daughter and she says, so what are you going to do today, Nana? And uh, Nana says, oh, uh, I'm going to run the lake run. And, and this woman says, so what's that? Oh, I have to run around a lake and empty a box of beer. And this woman looks at me like, when is the father going to interfere? When is he going to stop this? And uh, I don't because I'm a Scandinavian and I'm used to drunk kids in the street. And uh, and she goes, but don't you get sick, Nana? And she goes, oh yeah, but if we vomit synchronized, time will be deducted, so that's okay. <laughs> and this woman gets a little bit more disturbed. And then she says, what about the police? And Nana says, oh, but the teachers are there. And I, when I saw her uh, American head fall apart in that moment, I thought, 
there's something about Danish drink, drinking culture that, that I need to explore. But apparently, this is happening all over the world. I, I <laughs> well, it is interesting because you you know you're sort of confronted by by someone else saying this is strange. And you're like, no, it's not. This is what I grew up with. And, yeah. you know, I grew up in, in a culture where the drinking age was 18 and, and we, I was going to bars and, you know, I wasn't doing a lake run because we didn't have a lake, but, you know, it is interesting to kind of see those, you know, little points of friction. Yeah. Um, but the, the track team at my college did a, a what they called a beer mile. So that was a similar, I don't know if the rules are exactly the same, but it was a similar uh, setup. Right. Yeah, well, drinking is universal and has been here forever. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that is all the time we have for now, but thank you so much for joining the American Cinematheque and for me and, and me for, you know, uh, having, you know, talking to me about this film. It's such a great film. I loved it. I can't wait to see what you guys do next. And um, this was a great discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Katie, Mass, Thomas, thank you again. Thank you. It was a wonderful conversation. We're so happy to have all three of you.